Praise God. It's good to be home. Amen. Amen. Glory. I want to talk to you about the fact that the impossible is the believer's playground. The impossible should be where we live. We should never live in the possibilities of man, but always in the impossibilities of man. Because the impossibility of man now puts us in the possibilities of God. Amen. We find that, Lord God, behold, you've made the heavens and the earth by your great power. An outstretched arm, there's nothing too hard for you, Jeremiah 32, 17 says. Philippians 4, 13 says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I love that passage of Scripture, and we need to get it in our spirit. And I'm tired of people telling me that but not living that. Isn't it amazing? I can do all things that Christ who strengthens me because you pray for me. I don't know if I'm going to make it. Something's awry. Something's amiss. Amen. We do not want a religion or a faith of emotion. We want a faith that is operational, that doesn't move by emotion, but moves by the firm foundation of God's Word. Amen. Amen. And if we understand the presence of the Holy Spirit, we recognize that he does nothing outside of the Word of God, period. That is his assignment. He says in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, in verse 9, a scripture that is my, was my mother's favorite verse of, of all the verses in the scripture. And, and as, we, as we look at that verse, we, we understand that God is trying to get something into us that we need to, under, that we need to know, Amen. And he talks about the fact that I have seen, ear heard, or entered into the heart of man the things that God has prepared for those who love him. The things that God has prepared for those that love him. The things that God has, not things that God will, not things that I ask for, but things that he's already put in place. See, again, you've heard me teach this many times, but God does not live in the past. He does not hang out in the present. He spends his time in eternity. And he comes from eternity which is complete to take us from the present into that which he has prepared for us. Glory to God. So he can't prepare something for us and come back and try and create something that hasn't already been created. He's the alpha, he's the omega, he's the beginning and he's the end. All things were made by him and for him. There's nothing new under the sun. Therefore, what you think you have God, you need God to do, he's already done. You just need a revelation. Glory to God. I said, you need a revelation. Now watch this now. He says, I have not heard, or have seen, ear have not heard, enter the heart of man, things God has prepared for them. But God has revealed them to us through his Holy Spirit. For the Spirit searches all things, yes, the deep things of God. The word things, there's a word called pragma. The word pragma is that which was, is, and has already been created for the future. It's not something that's going to be, it's already is a be. I'm not trying to be, I am be. I, I, I am the be. Amen. I be what God created me to be because everything that he's created me to be has already been. Hmm. For what man knows the things of God except the spirit of man, which is in a man, even so no one knows the things of God except the spirit of God. Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit is, who is from God, that we might know the things that have been freely given to us by God. Don't you want to know what God's freely giving you? Oh, I don't want anything from God. I want everything from God. I'm sorry. I'm not one of those who walks around trying to act spiritual saying, I don't need anything from God. Yes, you do. You're going to hell without it. <laughs> I need Jesus. But you can't have Jesus and not everything goes. Yeah, yeah. Right. Yeah. <sighs> Years ago, when we were in the old property on 1500 North State Route 7, we had this incredible bookstore that, that we had that back in those days. And my, uh, my daughter, Heather, 
was about three years old at the time, I think. And so I get a call from the uh, manager of the bookstore and said, uh, Pastor, can we talk to you? I said, certainly. I said, what's going on? They said, your daughter's in here. Well, she's three. You know, she's in the church. You know, she kind of, kind of like say, as she talks to everybody, laughs at everybody, and makes everybody do what she wants. And that's my granddaughter. But so I said, well, what's the problem? They said, well, she came in here and she's grabbed a bunch of items she, that she's walking out with. I said, what do you mean she's walking out with them? She said, well, she's just walking out with them. I said, well, she can't do that. She says, I told her that, but she said she could. (laughs) And when I said to her that you can't do that because you have to pay for it, she says, my dad owns this joint. (laughs) See, we're laughing a little bit about that, but you know what world? My dad owns this joint. Our problem is, as kids, we just don't know our daddy well enough. Because my daughter knew that she was going to get what she came for and knew that it was paid for. Now, you understand, she didn't know it was paid for that I was going to have to come in after she left and pay for it. But she knew her daddy paid for it all. Oh, God. It was freely given to her. Why? Because of her daddy. There's some things that God's prepared for you that you're going to have to understand what it takes to walk in that, in that dynamic or that level because there's stuff waiting on you to recognize it. I mean, can you imagine there's raises waiting on you to recognize it? There, there, there's healing waiting on you to recognize it. There's favor waiting on you to recognize it. waiting on you. Can't you see it? He says over in 2 Corinthians 4, 18, stop looking at that which is seen. It's temporal. Start looking at that which is not seen. It is eternal. He says in Mark eleven twenty two through 24, that if you say this mountain and not doubt in your heart, but believe those things which you say or desire. Whew. Come on, folks. See, we just don't believe it anymore. Well, I know what God says. Don't you love it? Every promise in the book is mine. Liar, liar, pants on fire. Because every promise in the book I don't need. I just need the ones that are assigned to me. Oh, There's assignments for purpose and destiny that God's already put in place. Luke 137 says nothing's impossible for God. I wrote this down. We do the difficult. God will do the impossible. I said we do the difficult. God will do the impossible. 2 Kings chapter 6. Turn there for a moment, please. And when the servant of the man of God arose early and went out, there was an army surrounding the city with horses and chariots. And his servant said to him, Alas, master, what are we going to do? Next verse. So he answered and said, Don't fear. For those who are with us are more than, <laughs> than those that are with them. And next verse. And Elisha prayed. Wow. Prayed and said, Lord, I pray, open his eyes that he may see. The Lord opened the eyes of the young man, and he saw, and behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elijah. The question is, when did the army show up? When did the horses and the fire, and where did, when, when did they show up? They'd always been there. He just couldn't. See, what you can't see, you can't activate. And it takes the Word of God painting on the canvas of your mind under the presence of the Holy Spirit the pictures of what God has prepared for you. And he's not going to show you something that's irrelevant for what you have need of for purpose. So when I walk in purpose, I position myself for revelatory insight. But a lot of times we're praying for stuff that has nothing to do with our purpose. We're praying for stuff that has everything to do with how we see the world rather than how God sees us. I want God to show me how he sees me. I really don't care what the world looks like. If I can see myself the way God sees me, then I can walk in that purpose. Amen? 
2 Kings chapter 7, verse 3. We talked about taking responsibility for yourself. Over in 2 Kings chapter 7, we'll pull that up. Now, there were four leprous men at the entrance of the gate, and they said one to another, why are we sitting here until we die? I'm just going to leave it there. I'll, I'll talk about that verse. But I want you to get in your spirit, why sit here till I die? They're sitting on the outside of the walled city because they're leprous men. They cannot go inside. Some of you are sitting here. You heard my wife teach on Exodus last week. Some of you are sitting in a place because you're not allowed to go to the next place. And you're allowing the circumstance and the situation to tell you, stay put where you belong. And we've used the excuse of we didn't come from the right side of the tracks. Our skin's the wrong color. Or I don't have the right education. Or I don't have the money to do something. So you're just sitting there dying. But these four lepers said, listen, if we sit here, we're dying. If we go into the city, we're dying. If we go down there, we're dying. But perhaps, perhaps God will give us favor. My God. Of course, we know the rest of the story. They got down there, and God had already created a, a whole thing with the enemy. They thought that, that they were going to be defeated. The enemy had ran, and they were dead and gone, and everything was gone. And all the spoils of the enemy was theirs. Now, what the unique thing was about it is that rather than taking the spoils and keeping it to themselves, they said, this is not good. What we have found is a, is a real Gain for us should be shared with everybody. God never blesses you not to be shared with someone else. Amen? Well, but, but we understand something here. We, we understand, defy the circumstance. Take responsibility for yourself. Isaiah 43, verses 18 and 19. We have to learn to leave the past behind. Last week we heard about that in the message. But do not remember the former things, nor consider the things of old. Next verse. Behold, I will do a new. God can't do a new thing as long as you're doing this. I remember what they said about me. I remember how they treated me. I remember how bad it was done, how th- people did bad things to me. Why? Remembering all that, does that help you? God cannot do a new thing to you willing to forget the past. It shall spring forth. Shall you not know it? I will even make a road in the wilderness and give you rivers in the desert, says the Lord. Number one, defy the circumstances. Number two, take responsibility for yourself. Number three, leave the past behind. Walk by faith and not by sight. 2 Corinthians 5 and 7, walk by faith and not by sight. Activate the power of the kingdom of God by walking by faith. Speak the answer and not the problem. Release the Holy Spirit to operate. Psalms 45 and 1. Let's put that up on the screen. My heart is overflowing with a good theme. I recite my composition concerning the king. My tongue is the pen of a ready writer. Write your own script for life. Write your own sitcom for life. Write your own future for life. Stop letting the system to write it for you. Growing up, we used to watch Popeye. Some of you wouldn't know who Popeye is. If you do, that lets you know you've been aged. (laughs) I am who I am, and that's who I am. He was weird. He had these big forearms. It was stupid. He ate spinach. Who likes that stuff? (laughs) But he said, I don't care what you think or you think or you think. I know who I am. If you say you can, you will. If you say you can't, you won't. If you listen to people that are negative around you, you'll never get to where you need to go. Bless some of your hearts. You need to tell some of your friends, 
I'm not only going to friend you off of Facebook, I'm defriending you out of my life. You don't realize that at times you can be doing a good thing, but it's not the right thing. There was a season in my life that I was involved in so many things, and they were all good things. I was a regent at Oral Roberts University. I was a trustee of Charismatic Bible. I was a member of Dr. Cho's Church Growth Board. I was a, a part of International Congress Local Church's Vice President. I traveled around the world. I, I, I spoke in a, in a stadium of 250,000 people at Dr. Cho's. I, I would speak to his congregation on Sunday morning of 40,000 people per service. That's good. But it wasn't right. I didn't realize that my future was being affected, thinking that I was building a future because I was in all the right places with all the right people and in all the right settings. And I was speaking in all the major conferences. And during that day, I was sitting there with the biggest and the best. They'd have a Ken Copeland speak, and then I would speak. Jack Hayford would speak, and then I would speak. Cho would speak, and then I would speak. You don't get any better than this, guys. Spoke at conferences, and man, I thought, I am somebody. Then I had a heart attack in 2000. I won't go through all of that. It's another story at another time. Y'all, most of y'all know that. But when God raised me back up, I'm sitting in my back patio and, and at my house, and I'm in a three-month rehabilitation thing, and God begins to deal with me. And he says, the problem you've got is you've allowed people in your life to have nothing to do with your future. Get rid of them. I said, but they're godly men. He said, it has nothing to do with being godly. They're destroying your future. Whew. See, just because you want to be somebody, it's not found by being around other people who are somebody. Me being somebody is found in me being who God called me to be. So I had to drop off every one of those boards. Now, the ironic part about it is we dropped off all of those boards, and they would all say to me, well, you know, if you don't, we won't have the time to be with you. You won't be here. You won't be there. You're never going. Uh, great. But since then, we've been around the world. Since then, God has blessed us in such a measure that we're totally debt-free in our own personal life. Since then, God has given us influence to speak to hundreds of thousands of people. I just don't have anybody who's not a part of my future participating in my ministry anymore. Oh, I just messed some of you up, didn't I? You need to be careful who you hang out with. You can't speak the answer if you're letting other people telling you what to say. You ever been around a group of people that's talking politics? Oh, I don't talk politics. If you stay around them long enough, you start talking politics. As the age old thing, if you hang around a barbershop long enough, you're going to get a haircut. <laughs> so don't hang out where you don't want to be. Don't participate with those who are not talking what you're talking. Don't be a part of someone else's celebration when God's trying to throw you a party. Amen. <laughs> Praise God. Say, where are you going with this? Stay with me. We're going someplace. Death and life is in the power of the tongue. You're going you're gonna to live and eat and satisfied by the fruit of your lips. Proverbs 18, 21. Now, your desire must be greater than your problem. Desire is a creative force. Psalms 37, 4. Put that up there. It says, delight yourself in the Lord. He'll give you the desires of your heart. I, I, I just had to get, separate myself from people who thought it was wrong for me to have desires for things. And they teach this stuff. And I found out that everything I have from God is based upon whether I desire it or not. If I don't desire it, it has no value to me. It has no meaning to me. Amen? Amen? My question to you is, what do you desire? What are your desires? 
Well, I'll just desire what the Lord has for me. Then that goes back to the things he prepared for you. You better find out what he's prepared for you then because then you can desire what he has created for you. But most people, they don't know what he created, so their desires is based upon worldly things rather than spiritual things. Let's move a little bit further here due to time. This is one of my favorites. What you tolerate will not exit your life. Stop tolerating the spirit of destruction. No longer accommodate your circumstances. What you tolerate will not exit your life. It's not going anywhere. But what do you put up with? Oh, I don't know. They're nice people. I don't care how nice they are. Get rid of them. If it, if it is not a benefit to your future, if it's not a benefit to the kingdom of God, if it doesn't cause you to bring glory to the kingdom of God and produce fruit, get rid of it. Because if you tolerate it, it's not going anywhere. What you celebrate or what you do not celebrate will exit your life. If you don't celebrate something, it's not going to stick around. I learned this from my professor in psychology in, in, in college. What you feed will grow and what you starve will die. If I don't learn to celebrate my wife, I might lose her. If I don't learn to celebrate my children and they're growing up, I might lose them. If I don't learn to celebrate my friends, I can lose them. If I don't learn to celebrate my walk in presence and being in the presence of God. In other words, you know, that's the biggest thing that happened during the COVID is we've learned to stay home by watching live streaming. And thank God you're watching live streaming. Bless you. But don't make that your church. You can't get at home what you get here because you are not celebrating the presence of God. And while I thank God that we can go around the world through the technology of today, I realize that the greatest place for me to be is in the church. Celebrating the presence of God, the family of God. I want to sell, I don't want to lose that presence. I don't want to lose that family. I don't want to lose the, the, the anointing on my life and the glory of God in my life. I don't want to lose those things. And you have to work at it. My wife and I married 43 years. Tonight, when we leave here today, tonight we'll be going on a date night. How did you say married 43 years? Because I'm still dating her. What you celebrate will not leave you, trust me. But what you do not celebrate will exit your life eventually. The love's gone out of our marriage. Well, when did you stop celebrating it? The heart. Well, let me go back to what you do celebrate. If you do not celebrate, it will exit your life. What you feed grows, what you storm dies. Luke 638. That's a giving scripture. Yeah, about that. But let's read it. Luke 6, 38. It talks about the process of giving. We got it up yet? There it is. Give and it will be given to you. Hmm. Isn't it amazing how we always use that as dollars and cents? Does it, you see money up here? Give. So if I give kindness, come on. It'll be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, will be put into your bosom. For with the same measure that you use, it will be measured back to you. In other words, what I celebrate will produce celebration back into my life. Well, nobody loves me. Well, who do you love? Nobody cares. Well, who do you care for? Nobody's ever done anything for me. Well, what have you done for someone? There's a process here. 
And we, we as children of God, and, and we, we love a move of the Spirit, but I got news for you. When I go home today, what happened with the glory here was wonderful, but what came out of the Word of God in me that produces a harvest out of me is going to decide how my life is going to go. Hmm, three people, that's great. If any two shall agree on earth as touching any one thing. <laughs> Look at Matthew chapter 5, verses 13 through 16. I want you to see this. Matthew chapter 5. Okay. You are the salt of the earth. Hmm. But if the salt loses its flavor, how shall it be seasoned? It is then good for nothing but to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. Next verse. You are the light of the world, a city that is set on a hill that cannot be hidden. Next verse. Nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket, but put it on. In other words, you've got to be seen. Hmm. Put it on a lamp, said. It gives light to all who are in the house. Next verse. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. That they may see your good works and may glorify your Father in heaven. In other words, learn to celebrate the gift that God has given you and quit walking around with his fake humility. Get out there and say, look what God has done. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. God said that greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. You're sick. I'm going to pray for you. You need a word of encouragement. I've got a word for you. Don't sit back and act like you're so shy that the world can't see what God has done in you. Celebrate your salvation. Celebrate your deliverance. Celebrate the power of the Holy Spirit in you. Celebrate the blessings of the Lord. Celebrate the goodness of God in the land of the living. Learn how to feed that so it will grow. Years ago, Dr. Fred Price was someone that I looked at as a mentor for a number of years back in 85, 86, 87. And he was telling a story about on, when he got filled with the Holy Spirit, began to believe God for healing. And he talked about every Sunday night, he said, we're having a healing service. He said the first Sunday night, people showed up. He lined them all up front. He said, I prayed for everybody in a row, about, probably about 40, 50 people. He said, nobody got healed. He said, praise God. Next Sunday night, we're having a healing service. And this went on for a few weeks. He said, but one Sunday night, all you need is one. Theo Osborne used to say, he'd look at a million people in his crowd and say, God, you show me the one that needs to be healed, and then it's, it's all over with. He never looked at the crowd of the sick people. He looked for the one that God told him to pray for, that the miracle was going to produce all the other miracles. He said, we've been seeing people healed every Sunday night since then. He said, but it took me a few weeks to get there, but I kept celebrating the Word of God that by His stripes we're healed. We could lay hands on the sick and they would recover. He said, we were doing it all. He said, we were anointed with oil. The elders were praying. He says, I was, I was speaking over them. But one Sunday night, the miracle took place. <sighs> Glory to God. Glory to God. Mm -mm -mm. The heart is the candle of the Lord. It's the transparency of man's motivation, the heart. As a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. What do you think this morning? I'm just curious. When you came here today, what were you thinking? Oh, I wasn't thinking anything. Maybe that's why you're still sitting there. Maybe as well you'll leave, you'll get a handshake. Maybe somebody will hug you, tell you they love you. You'll go, what a friendly church. And that's all you got. I don't want just that. I want somebody to shake my hand. I want somebody to kiss my cheek. I want somebody to love on me. I want somebody to make me feel welcome. I want all the above, but I want a little more than that. 
Come on. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I didn't come. I know this sounds weird, but I didn't come to hang out. I came with purpose today. The heart, what's in my heart? My heart, what you think about most is the direction your life will go in. That which consumes your thought process will rule you. When I, when I see people on Facebook and all they do is talk about politics, I go, oh God. And they call themselves a Christian. When I see people that all they talk about is, is, is their, their, you know, their so-called multi-level marketing. Oh God. Where's Jesus? Folks, I got news for you. Our conversation should be about Jesus. I was with Dr. John Evazini. We were sitting in Tulsa, Oklahoma. We were in a meeting. It was about five or six pastors at a dinner one night. And they're all talking. They're telling jokes and all that. Brother John looks at me and I look at him. And, I, and he, he said, what are you thinking? I said, I'm out of here. He says, so am I. We're walking to the door. He said, where are you going? We said, we're going to talk about Jesus and the Lord. We, I, we don't have time to hear your stories. I don't have time to hear gossip. I don't have time to hear stories that are just about nothing. I I need to be around some cutting edge stuff. I I need to be around somebody who's a visionary. I I want to be around somebody who's believing God for a miracle. I I want to be around somebody who says, I believe that we can change this area in the world in which I live. I want to be around somebody who believes that South Florida can be changed. I want to be around somebody who believes that God is about to do something new. I can't help what's happening with the economy. I can't help what's happening in the government. I can't help what's happening with the Republicans and the Democrats. I can help what's happening with me. So I can't think on what Biden's going to do or what the others are going to do, whatever, what, Trump. How many more times are we going to talk about Trump, folks? I can't, listen, praise God, I pray for him. I pray for our president, but I am not going to sit around and let what people say about them or what they've said affect who I am. I don't have time for that. Oh, don't you know Jesus is coming back? The world's falling apart. No, Jesus isn't coming back yet. No, 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 no. He's got to get the church in gear. Don't you see how bad? Stop it. The church has got to be without spot or wrinkle. He's not coming back for a broken down hall. He doesn't go to the junkyard to get spare parts. He said, when I come back, number one, the Jews are going to be jealous of the church. And I love Israel. But they're going to get jealous of us. You know why? Because they're going to see the hand of God upon the church. That's another, maybe next Sunday I'll get into this about the separation that's taking place. Because there's a great divide. The separation is taking place. And God's taking the real and putting it over here. And he's putting the fakers over here. Hmm. I don't have time to talk about that. Jesus is coming back. You're absolutely right. I got to get ready. You're absolutely right. 100%. That should be my my whole focus is to be ready for Jesus. But it's not to talk about all these other people who are trying to put fear in me to think about what the world. I don't care what the world's doing. I pray for the salvation of the world. I pray for evangelizing the world. Going all the world and preach the gospel. But I don't. I could care less. Well, you know, I was reading an end-time prophecy over in the book of uh, uh, Ezekiel, and it's talking about this in the book of Revelation. Oh, look at this. Look at the trumpets of God. And you should know all of that. And I do, and I study it, and I know it, and I appreciate it. But I got news for you. It doesn't control my life. What controls my life is Jesus is Lord. You want to talk post? You want to talk mid? You want to talk trib? You want to talk kingdom? What do you want to talk? I know all of them. Believe it or not, I went to seminary. They taught us all of these things. And I loved it. The professor, and he said, listen, depending on where you're at and what you need to do. And by the way, you're going to see as time goes on, the way governments are, things change. So we can take Iraq and put that over here, and it's Iran today. Excuse me? And the United States can fit in here, or we can take and put them over here. That's not the way the Bible works, folks. I don't care where they put them. Jesus is coming back. Those that are ready are going to be called on the air to meet him. Somebody said, aren't you afraid of tribulation? Nope. 
Nope. Why not? Because greater is he that's in me than he is in the world. Because I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Because no weapon formed against me shall prosper. Because if God be for me, who can be against me? It's kind of hard to make me go through tribulation when God says he can't touch that. So I've got to be out of here. Now, if you're all around, <laughs> adios. <laughs> but if you're ready, and that's our focus, our focus should be being ready. Yeah. Amen? Not what's going on, but about being ready. And that's our focus. I'm ready for Jesus. He, I, know the, I don't know the hour or the time, but I'm ready. If he wants to come back tomorrow, I, according to Scripture, I don't see it happening. But I don't care. I'm ready. Come, Lord Jesus. My name's in the Lamb's Book of Life. I've, I've run my race. I'll be honest with you. I, I was thinking my wife might talk about I've got one more thing in my race that i got to accomplish. We're going to build a Bible college. After that... Is however he wants me to hang out. I've done everything else. I've gone to the places he told me to go. I've done what he told me to do. I've touched the people he told me to touch. I've built what he's told me to build. I've given what he told me to give. I feel good. Come, Lord Jesus. But my purpose has not been completed because when he raised me up off of that deathbed with a, when I flatlined, and he gave me the vision. The last thing that's still on the table is you're going to build a Bible college. Amen. So I'm still going to be around for a while. Yeah. We're not going to build it real fast. We're just going to do it kind of slow. <laughs> <laughs> that was a joke. <clears throat> what is in the heart, it consumes your thought and process for your rule of your life. Learn to feed on God's word. It's where the answers will be found. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, then you can ask what you will and it shall be done. John 15, 7. Give first place to the Holy Spirit. As men is led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. Romans 8, 14. I don't have time to get into that. Our time is fleeting and I want to get, get into something here in just a moment. But The Holy Spirit is your guide. Never dishonor the Holy Spirit. Take time, reverence, make room, celebrate. Right. He's your guide. No one can destroy your dream but you. Deuteronomy 29, 29. It says, the secret things belong unto God, but those things which he revealed belong unto you and to your children forever. So they are yours. So the only one that can alter that dream is you. Hmm. And it's so easy to get weary. And he says, don't be weary in well-doing. It's so easy to have so many conflicts come into your life that you lose sight of your purpose and your destiny. But every one of you are called of God as a chosen generation. Every one of you came to this world, you are fearfully and wonderfully made. Every one of you has purpose in life. And if you can stay focused on that in spite of circumstances and situations, then you can walk through every valley and survive. You can go through every storm and not be taken out. You can get knocked down and you can get back up. Deuteronomy 30, 19 says, I put blessings and curses before you. Choose you this day. You make the choice. Come on, look at somebody and say, you make the choice. Hmm. Last but not least, seed time and harvest is the guarantee for miracles. Seed time and harvest is nothing more than faith and action. It deals with your time, your talent, your energy, and your finance. It's awful hard. It's really important to understand something. There's a difference between the just shall live by faith and getting in a position that we live by faith. The miracles of mercy. I thank God for the miracles of mercy. Because sometimes, <laughs> oh, thank you, Jesus. But as a child of God, I don't live by the miracles of mercy. I live by faith. 
By faith, I please God. And so faith is based upon our heartfelt belief, not only in who Jesus is, but in what he said. See, if I don't believe what somebody says, I don't believe in who they are. If I don't believe in what they say, then I can't believe in who they are. But if I believe in who they are, then I don't have a problem believing in what they say. You understand? And the Bible says that God established this world with the seed of his word. And God said, let there be. The sower sows the word. That's why Satan comes immediately to steal the word. Because the word of God is seed. And when you are a possessor of seed, you have a right to the harvest. And because you have a right to the harvest, you now have a right to ownership. But without the sowing of a seed, you don't have a right to harvest, therefore you have no ownership. So what seeds do I sow? I sow time. I sow talent. I sow energy. Yeah. I sow money. But we'll come to a service and we'll be at home on live streaming. And we want God to give us a miracle. And we go, well, I just... I've been at this thing a long time. I, I, I just want to come to service. Really. If you're not putting anything in, you don't have a right or authority to take anything out. My mother, musicians, y'all can come. My mother went through a difficult time to where for C, she could not get out of the bed. Had a back problem, some other things, couldn't get out of bed. Say, well, you pray for her? I prayed for her. I believe God to heal her. But nevertheless, I, you know, I just kept trusting God. It didn't stop me from believing for that. But she said, well, if while I'm laying in this bed, I'm not just going to lay here and watch Christian TV. Sounds real bad. I'll watch Christian TV. Wow. Aren't you spiritual? You have 42 different teachers teaching you 42 different things, and you wonder why you're confused. But anyway. Another, that's another subject for another day. <clears throat> she told my dad, give me the phone book. And he said, what are you going to do? She said, I'm going to start calling people. He said, what do you mean? When are you call? She said, who are you going to call? She said, I'm going to start in the A's. <laughs> he says, in the A's? She says, yeah, I'm calling everybody in the A's. And she called him. You don't know me. My name is Edith Thomas. And I want you to know that God loves you. If you need prayer, I would love to pray with you. But I want you to know how much God loves you. Some would hang up on her. Some would break down and start crying, going, we, we were calling out to God. We needed somebody. Some she led to Christ, rededicated their lives. But she refused to sit on the seat of do nothing and do nothing. And then you wonder why abundant life is where it is today. Because the founders refused to sit by the wayside and not sow the gifts and the talents and the seeds they had. I walked into Big Bear after my dad had passed away. Sat down at the booth, my wife and I. The waitress comes up, introduces herself and says, you don't know me, but she began to weep. She says, but we knew your father. And he would come here every Wednesday. And he would order the same thing. He never looked at a menu. His meal cost him $8 and something. And he'd leave a $20 bill. And I'd always say, you want your change? He said, did I ask for change? He said, what I want to do is I want to pray for you. She said, he changed my life. I walked into the bank. When dad had retired and he was in his 80s, I'd give him a check every week from the church because he was the founder, didn't have a retirement. But I'd give him a check. And he'd go to the bank every Monday morning and cash his check. I was in the bank after dad died, and they say, I found out about the story. 
The teller, teller came around from behind the thing. She hugged my neck. She was crying. She said, you don't know what your dad meant to us. She said, he come in here every Monday morning. I had the privilege to cash his check. And he'd give every one of us tellers a $20 bill and say, go have lunch on Jesus. Do you need prayer? He refused to sit on the sidelines and let life pass him by without sowing of his time, his talent, his energy, and his finance. My mom refused to lay on a bed that she died on and allow the circumstances to defeat her and keep her from sowing seed. And then you wonder why abundant life is where it is today. Some of you are sitting here, and I love you with all of my heart, but you're doing nothing. You used to do stuff, but you don't do it anymore. Some of you are sitting home right now, and you're doing nothing. You let COVID convince you it's okay. And the enemy is robbing you of your future, robbing you of your purpose, robbing you of your miracles because you're doing nothing. Well, I don't know. It's not about works of righteousness. I'm not talking about works of righteousness. I'm talking about fulfilling purpose and destiny. Doing what God's called me to do. And by the way, it's not about works of righteousness you're saved, but people know you're saved by the fruit that you bear. By their fruits, you shall know them. Hey, thanks for watching the Abundant Life YouTube channel. We hope that today's message has blessed your life. And don't forget, if you enjoyed today's sermon, you can always subscribe as well as share this message with your family and friends. Also, to support the ministry, be sure to hit the giving link located in the description below. Through your giving, we're able to continue to spread the gospel and reach our world with the life-changing message of Jesus Christ. Also, you can join us Sundays for all of our stream services on Facebook Live and AbundantLife.tv. And remember this, that God is a good God. He loves you and He wants to bless you today. Take care.